Well, the first thing that struck me about Patricia Pearson, and, and it might strike you too if you have a look at her biog on page 29, is that she doesn't really read like the kind of person who would be open to uh, a discussion of death and dying and what may lie in between. Uh, she's a journalist. She's committed to skepticism and hard facts, and yet there were occurrences in her own life that got her thinking about things in a different way. So would you welcome Patricia Pearson. This is her book, <laughs> Opening Heaven's Door, What the Dying May Be Trying to Tell Us About Where They're Going. Patricia. Oh, yeah. <sighs> okay, well, so I have this recurring nightmare that I find myself on the stage of a concert hall, but I've like forgotten my clarinet, and for some reason I'm in a god pod, and I'm disoriented, and so, so how did I get here? Um, well, my story begins in the spring of 2008, when my father um, died very unexpectedly. We didn't realize that there was anything wrong with him. He died of heart failure in the middle of the night in his bed in Ottawa. And we were all shocked, of course. But my sister, who was in Montreal, was elated. And the reason for this was because she happened to be awake in her bedroom at the time that my father died, and she was in a state of tension and dread because she had cancer, and she suddenly was suffused with this extraordinary uplift of emotion and sort of, um, she described it as a kind of wave of spiritual energy, even though that wasn't in her vocabulary or in her background. She didn't go to Sedona and buy crystals, none of that. So this was a very, very specific and singular subjective experience that she had. She then sensed a presence in her bedroom, and she felt hands cupping, gently cupping the back of her head, and she had a series of visions of her unborn granddaughter, who was named Katie, in this vision. And this went on for about two hours. So it was just this wave of peace and elation and joy. She was amazed. She had no idea what this experience meant. She emailed her boyfriend about it. She told my nephew about it. And then she got the phone call that dad had died. So this became, in my family, which is a very secular family, an extraordinary collision of a coincidence and an unusual, unprecedented experience. So even if you take away the fact of the coincidence of my father dying in that moment, you still have this remarkable experience that my sister took with her, in effect, when she died two months later. So I, as a journalist, and you know, after kind of a period of time of being blown over sideways by losing two of my family members, I started to wonder about this, um, and I started to talk about it to people around me. And what I found, and I was amazed, was the commonness of this experience. So people would keep saying, I've never told anybody this, but, and then these shy confidings would come forth, and they would say, I woke up in the middle of the night because I thought the window had shattered, I hopped out of bed, I was trying to pick out the shards of glass from my blanket, there was nothing there, and I found out the next day that my daughter had gone through the windshield of a car. Or they will say, and this was actually a neurosurgeon, John Small, I was standing in my kitchen, and all of a sudden there was this kind of descending shimmer of darkness that I somehow knew to be deaf and female, and then the policeman knocked on the door and said, your female neighbor has just died. Or a record company executive said to me, I went downstairs as a child, I saw my father at the table reading the paper, and then my mother came in and said that he had died in the night. So these experiences are um, primarily, uh, they can be visual, but they can be auditory. They can just be a kind of very, very vivid um, gnosis. So it's just a gleaning, an absolute certainty. So for example, a friend of mine 
was walking along the Danforth actually just about two weeks ago, and she saw her uncle walk into the big carrot, which surprised her because he has Louis Body's dementia and is in a home. So she was going to follow him, but then she thought, that can't be, that can't be my uncle. But she knew it was her uncle, she said. And then she went home and found out that he died. So there's a quality of um, <clears throat> extremely vivid certainty about these experiences. Uh, people will take action. They'll drive 50 miles, or they will um, make urgent phone calls, or they will um, chase somebody down the street. Um, and it can happen not just at the moment of death, but actually just in distress scenarios. So mothers will suddenly realize that their daughters are in peril in some way. Um, so it's really, really vivid. It's really, really common, like extremely prevalent. Um, and in fact, it's so prevalent that you even find it on a Chipotle restaurant bag. <laughs> My daughter brought this home. She brought takeout home from Chipotle restaurant. And there's an actual description of what I'm talking about from the novelist Amy Tan on this, about seeing her mother in her bedroom within 24 hours of her dying. So the question is, and that's just one set of experiences that I talk about in my book, but the question is, what is what, you know, why are we being so quiet about these things? I mean, this is, are we this quiet about falling in love? Are we this quiet about um, our anger, about any of our other human emotions? No, but we hold these things very, very tightly, very, very quietly, because we're afraid that they will be stomped on. So is this a question of the laity versus the scientists? Is that the divide that's going on here? And the answer is actually no. And this really surprised me, and I don't, oh, there it is. Oh yeah, don't worry about hell, I'm not talking about heaven. Okay, so, so this is what surprised me a lot when I started doing this research. So in 2014, 100 scientists, and these are scientists from Cambridge, from Harvard, from Princeton, from UBC, from University of Virginia, et cetera, et cetera, published an open letter to their colleagues saying, we want to be able to study all aspects of consciousness. Stop pushing back on us. We want to start looking at the possibility that consciousness can flow cross-temporally, that it can go across time, and that it can go across space, non-locally. Now, why are they saying that, these prestigious scientists? Well, because they're finding it in their data. So this is uh, an example of the Pear Lab in Princeton. It's no longer operating, but it was for about 15 years. And what these guys did, they were engineers, and they were noodling around with random event generators, which are basically like little black boxes that electronically um, coin toss, ones and zeros, ones and zeros. So they generate random data. But what they did was they put these regs in 40 collaborating universities around the world, and they discovered that the data goes non-random, so it deviates, the red and the blue, when global consciousness is in heightened focus. So after 9-11, the reg data went non-random for 21 straight hours. So they've been testing this over this whole time, 15 years, and they've been playing around with it. They find that it happens like at New Year's Eve, for instance, so the reg will go non-random in a particular country or a time zone. And they just want to know, well, what have we got here? Like, what's going on here? Is there a way in which consciousness is having an impact on physical systems? Now, this one is uh, complicated and hard for me to explain, and I almost took it out. But basically, at Cornell and Northwestern, they are looking at the way that we have physiological reactions to stimuli a couple of seconds before we're actually exposed to it. So they're taking traditional psychology experiments where you're exposed to a neutral, scary, or erotic image, and then they're measuring the physiological response of the participants, and the participants are reacting before the computer has randomly designated what image they're going to see. And this has been peer-reviewed. It's been published in peer-reviewed journals. Why do I have the Grand Canyon there? Because I have a terrible fear of heights. So when I was trying to understand the idea of the physiological response, I look at that picture and the bottom of my toes tingle. So that's the kind of thing that they're measuring. 
Now, this is the most robust and long-standing data set that there is. This has been going on for 30 years. These are the Gansfeld telepathy studies. So what they, they operated on the premise that if you're going to get any kind of effect of non-local information transference, it's only going to happen in a super low stimulus environment. So the ears are covered, the eyes are covered, the light is low, and so on. And then somebody, a participant, is in another room, and they're given three or four images to choose from, to look at. Could be that, a cartoon. Could be an elephant. Could be a living room. And uh, the person who is, um, you know, got the ping pong balls on their eyes are uh, trying to guess which image the other guy is looking at. And what they're finding over time is a 7% above chance hit rate. So it shouldn't be at all above chance, not at all. But it's 7% above. Odds have been calculated at 29 million trillion to one. So this data has been out there. It's out there. And yet we, we can't um, accept it. So the uh, National Research Council in the United States asked uh, the Harvard psychologist Robert Rosenthal to look at the studies and to try to figure out where the methodology is screwing up. How can this be? It can't be. There must be something wrong. He did. That's his expertise, his methodology. And he found that they were of sound experimental design and that it would be implausible that the data was occurring by chance. And here's the important part. The NRC asked him to withdraw his findings. So he refused, and he's one of the signatories on that open letter to his colleagues. But the NRC wouldn't release the data. So here at, is at Harvard, they're doing some really interesting studies with time perceptions impact on physiology. So they take people and they put them in a sleep lab, and one group is told that they've slept for eight hours when they've only slept for five. A second group is told they slept for five hours when they have slept for eight. And the group that believes they're sleep deprived is registering um, physiological sleep deprivation. And the other group is fine, totally fine. So that isn't really getting at like, non-local consciousness. But I only bring it up because the woman who uh, runs some of these studies told me a couple of weeks ago that her graduate students, so her neuroscience graduate students at Harvard, come into her lab assuming that we have already proven that the, everything, belief, consciousness, is only in the brain. They assume that. So if they assume that, and she corrects them and says, no, that's a theory, then what the rest of us are going to do? I mean, all of us are going to take our lead from the, from the neuroscientists. All right, but really we've, what we've got is the hard problem of consciousness. So this is what has not been solved. Is the brain a receiver? So if you're thinking in terms of Game of Thrones, so a television is broadcasting horribly depressing and violent, yet somehow obsessively alluring show. <laughs> and, and it's, but it's not in the TV. It's, it's being picked up out of the air, right? So is that actually possibly how our brain is working with consciousness? Or this is the prevailing materialist view, is that Daenerys Targaryen and the screenwriters and the director and the musicians and the giants are all just in that one TV and coming out of that one TV, which is not plugged into anything, right? So that's, that's what we assume. And that's why all these people are having these experiences that they can't talk about, because it collides with that. So, this guy, this is about 100 years ago, Hans Berger, uh, a psychiatrist who invented the EEG. Why? Because he wanted to understand how it was that his sister knew that he'd almost been knocked over and killed by a horse-drawn cannon um, in a different village. And she'd gotten really upset, and she'd gotten the father to send a, a telegraph to make sure he was OK. And he was so fascinated by that that he thought maybe the EEG could somehow pick up some kind of evidence for how our brain is receiving these signals. So that was about 100 years ago. We've made very little progress since then, some, but 
This is Dean Radden, who's one of the main scientists in this area. If all the funds for cancer research spent in a single year were instead spent in one day, then the comparative funding for sci research worldwide and throughout history would consume a mere 43 seconds of that day. So when you find yourself in a position where somebody says they've had an anomalous experience that they can't explain, but it's very important to them and it's very profound, and you say, I'm skeptical, prove it, they can say to you, yeah, fund it. <laughs> Thank you. Patricia, you caught me unawares. Sorry. Bravo. Um, the manifestation of this thing with which I'm familiar, and I'm sure many people in the audience are familiar, are the reports of tunnels, right? People who have near-death experiences, they report right. tunnels. They report floating above and looking back down at their own body, their own cadaver and they report this transformative light. Yeah, so that's another piece in my book, was I actually went and interviewed people who'd had near-death experiences. Um, and what, what's really remarkable when you talk to people who've had NDEs is the, the unbelievable power of this um, experience of consciousness. So it's, it's ineffable, it's indescribable. They cannot explain to you this altered state of consciousness that they enter. Um, and that's kind of where the dialogue falls down because people don't understand what they're actually saying. But they experience it as being immersed in um, light that is simultaneously sentient and loving. So they're in like a kind of ocean of consciousness that's, that's profoundly comforting. And then they come back from that experience and it takes them on average about 12 years to integrate back into their lives because it's so unbelievably strange and fascinating fascinating stuff thank you so much <laughs> patricia